Welcome to Born or Made, the podcast that dives deep into the heart of success and identity. Are the traits that define us as leaders ingrained from birth, or are they carved out throughout our experiences? Join your host, Anne-Marie LaTulip, as we ask these questions to some of the most insightful and inspiring entrepreneurs of our time. Each episode, we explore their journeys, the decisions that shaped them, and how they've molded their own paths to success. So whether you're an aspiring entrepreneur, a seasoned business owner, or simply curious about the interplay between nature and nurture and professional growth, you're in the right place. Get ready for compelling stories, transformative insights, and a new perspective on what it really takes to make it in the world of entrepreneurship. Hi there, and welcome back to the Born or Made podcast. I am your host, Anne-Marie Latulip, and with me today, I have the lovely Brittany Abdizetti, and I said that right. I'm going to tell you a little bit about her. Brittany Cut her teeth in the marketing world while working on projects for industry titans like Russell Brunson, John Maxwell, and Tony Robbins. She has since become the go-to expert for high-ticket coaches needing to get more students from their existing audience. To date, her strategic insights have helped her clients generate over $5 million. She's also a Southeast-based actress and co-founder of Just Us Studio, a creative studio she runs with her boyfriend, Stephen Lewis. Welcome, Brittany. I'm so happy to have you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. So I just, I told everybody a, just a little bit about you. I would love it if you could tell us more and how, tell us about sort of your journey and how you got to be where you're at today. Yeah. So um, in the business world, I started as a copywriter um, because I was coming out of journalism school and um, communications degree, had a communications degree. And so that's really where I started. It was kind of an accident. I was blogging and um, someone found my blog and said, oh, do you write, do you ghost write blogs? And like any entrepreneur, I said, yes. And then I figured out how to do the thing yep. and <laughs> how to charge for it. And I had no idea, but I knew I had this skill set. I don't recommend people do that if you don't have the skill set. I knew I had the skill set. So I just had to figure out like how to package it and put it out there. Sure. Yeah. So I started doing that and um, it kind of snowballed into niching into emails, writing copy for emails. Um, and then the scope grew and I started writing copy for the sales pages that went to the emails and, you know, so on and so forth. So that was about seven years ago. And um, now, as you said, I work exclusively with high ticket coaches and um, help them get leads from their existing audience. So use a lot of that skill set. Also use a lot of my skill set from my work as an actor and as a producer with this creative company that I have with my boyfriend. Um, so all of the, like, we're talking about presentations and scripting and um, videos and all of that. So my skill sets kind of seem diverse, but end up working together really well um, in what yeah. I do. So it's, I'm blessed that it worked out that way. Yeah, no, that's great. Now, originally, did you want to be, is, you were in journalism, did you want to be a writer uh, originally or... Yeah, I was I was in broadcast journalism, um, okay. but I I was there because they told me you will never make money as a writer. That's what my guidance oh, told yeah. me. And so I was in broadcast journalism because I thought, well, I did I did have a background in acting, so I thought, all right, I'll be fine on camera. But I really was obsessed with the writing aspect of it, and I wanted to be in print journalism. They just discouraged me from that. So. Um, yeah, it was something that I really enjoyed. I was also on the school paper. I was, you know, I was always writing. Um, yeah, that was yeah. Business venture as a kid, I wrote a newspaper for my neighborhood and distributed it to all of my neighbors. Um, they oh, did that not is so it, cool! But they got it. <laughs> That's like the the you know the idea of the podcast is born or made. Are we born with entrepreneurial uh, tendencies? And that to me is definitely a, an entrepreneurial tendency, even yeah. when you were young. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. I've had 75 businesses in my life probably. <laughs> <laughs> so tell everybody or tell me, tell everybody a, a little bit about um, your acting. Like how did that start? What kind of projects have you done? Well, it started when I was very young. Um, I was uh, probably about six. Um, my mom was a set designer for our local theater. And so I was there, just there all the time. Yeah. And I was very fascinated by I, I didn't know at the time what it was called, but I was very fascinated by actors and how they switched states really quickly. 
like I would see them in the wings laughing and joking and and making plans for after and then they would run out onto stage and they would be bawling and having this really emotional scene and then they would come off and be laughing because someone's shoe fell off and I was like fascinated by their mastery of that yeah that really was like what drew me to acting I was just like really fascinated by that and I was also a dancer at the time so I was used to being on stage just kind of in a different capacity so I did that all the, the way through I, I was about 18, 17, 18 when I stopped and went to college um, and then recently got back into acting probably within the last three or four years. I'm 32 now. So recently got back into it after, you know, going through the entrepreneurial journey and like building my skill set up enough to support myself and to, you know, have have that base. And so now I'm back into it. I've done uh, several short, short plays in the area and um, one feature and then a couple short uh, films as well so I'm still kind of like you know getting my bearings in the world it's a big world um, yeah no it's been, it's been <laughs> for fun. sure yeah I dabbled in it and I didn't even barely get my feet wet but yeah absolutely so were you doing um theater professionally when you were a kid or was it regional what, what kind of jobs it was, it was local yeah it was local um it was a large theater it was over 400 seats so now looking back like now as an adult I'm like that was huge I don't know it yeah. just was I was in South Florida and so Miami it just was a big town and the organization that I was with which is established it just happened to be where my mom was working oh, okay. so like it just it, it was a large theater um, but I was not in lead roles I was like very much um, for Beauty and the Beast I was the flipping there's like a rug that I played to- that role did you really yes that's amazing. I played that that the the, the the magic carpet. Oh my gosh! What yeah, I played that at um in Sarasota at the, the Golden Apple Dinner Theater. I don't know if you ever heard of the Golden Apple, but it was it's not unfortunately not around anymore. But yeah, it was uh yeah I played that That's and wild. I played um one of the plates. <laughs> Beauty and the Beast is the best for that because you talk <laughs> to people and they're like, yeah, I was the teacup. Like yeah. seriously, you know, but it was a fun role. So yeah, you know that funny. I, flipped, I just flipped across the stage because yep. dancer. So flipped across the stage. Um, and then I did like Beauty and the Beast, and I was like one of the silly girls. So I just followed yeah. Gaston. on. I was yeah. on stage all the time because yeah. he was, but I was just following him around. Sure, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, that, that's funny. So so you were just a theater kid. You were grew yes. up in the theater. Uh, I love that. I think that's so cool because you have such a camaraderie of people around you. I didn't have that experience in the same theater, but I, you know, I was always in shows and and things like that. So I just, I think that's so cool. And not everybody gets to experience what that's like. So that, that's really, really cool. So now you're doing more film you had mentioned, right? Yes. Yeah. That, that's where I'm at mostly now. Um, It's just partly based on opportunity because, you know, as an actor, you take what's around. Um, but also I, I tend to, I always say I like the process of theater and I like the result of film because when you're a, a newer actor, it's like, it's all about footage. Like, because I don't have a ton of footage as a, someone who did theater, right. you know, sure. I, I have a resume, but I don't have footage. And so to share and like to, to get an agent, I was lucky enough to get an agent in the Southeast, but like, you gotta have footage. And so the process of theater is really fun to me. You build this community, like you're saying, mm-hmm. you have all of this, like you're with each other more than you're with your family often. And it's yes. very, um, you know, you have a lot of like trust building because you're on stage, whether you like it or not, someone's something falls off or falls yep. over. <laughs> so you're in that, but film, you know, you really have that product at the end. So um, I tend to gravitate towards film now. Oh, that's interesting the way that you put that and that yeah I can totally understand that's that's awesome that you were able to get an agent though good for you that's great so talk to me about the company or uh c- yeah company that you and your boyfriend started and I would love to know you had said earlier that that both of your talents are sort of meshing together uh to work together so I'd love to hear about the company and then how it's helping with your writing yeah so it's called Just Us Studio and it is a creative studio that houses all of our creative projects together. So my my writing and my business is rolled up into it. So um, I work with a lot of my a lot of my coach clients are often in the creative space. Um, I have someone who's a photographer, 
And so it just ends up being that way that I gravitate towards other creatives mm -hmm. that are doing creative. So it just kind of works out that way. Um, not always. I'm working with a health coach right now who's ne not necessarily in that space, but even the way that we like interact together, there's just that creative um, spirit. So it works well there. So yeah. my business is there. We also have a lot of, in our creative arm, we have a lot of different products. So we have um, two books that we're working on right now. One, of, oh, I don't have it here. Hopefully he's okay if I show you. Um, it's yeah. called Chameleon Kid and oh, he's God. illustrating it and writing it. Um, and it's about a boy who changes colors um, with his environment to blend into his environment and experiences the emotion that that color, so like blue is sadness. And so then at the end of the book, he has to make the choice of like, who is he regardless of the environment? Oh, so cool. it's like kids who are, you know, we, we work specifically with like foster care and like kids who are like in different environments all the time. So it kind of allows them to like understand a sense of self regardless of like external things. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we have that, we have another book coming out, um, in December and then we have several films. We both write scripts. So we have several films that are either in development or we're looking at potentially selling to a network or something at some point. So we're like developing those scripts, not necessarily for us to produce. So it is a creative house for all of our things. That That um, is cool. So it's not necessarily, um, like you don't have students or do you, you do you have students yeah. that you're teaching these things okay so it's just the two of you and your creative yeah products so and, and so does he come from an acting background also or he does well he was in the navy first for six ah. years so you know, just a natural jump right over into acting yeah. um he was in the navy and um he came out and went to school and um was kind of not to like get into his whole thing but he yeah. he was in school and I think they were, they had like a play that he was like just gonna try out for for fun or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and then he got loving it. Yeah. Um he was a musician before that. So he uh, similar to me had like stage experience. Like he yeah. so yeah he's very talented in all the creative arts um and then got a theater degree and has been doing basically as long as I've been doing entrepreneurship, he's been doing acting and all of that. So like we kind of were like in these parallel worlds for about the same amount of time so it's interesting because we now both in our respective fields have this like this sense of like foundation like I feel very confident now in my skill set as a writer and my skill set as a marketer like now it's been seven years I'm like okay I know what I'm doing I'm like feeling and he's feeling that way about his you know craft and so now it's kind of funny because I'm like going more as a beginner into acting and yeah you know, so we're kind of like doing this it's very yin yang. It's just how it worked out. Um, but yeah, so he's he's a veteran actor and a veteran. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Look at that. Interesting. That's awesome. Is he from Florida also? He is. Yeah, he's yeah, from okay. Florida. Yeah, we're native Floridians, which is rare. Yeah, I love Florida. I think I told you, but well, I just told you about Beauty and the Beast. But yeah, I lived in Orlando for a while, which that's where you're at right now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, I lived in Sarasota for a long time. So I just, I love Florida. I talk about it all the time. <laughs> yeah. It's, nice. it's great. Yeah. We, we love the weather. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So tell me then, we, I mentioned in your bio, and for anyone that doesn't know who Russell Brunson is, if you know me, you should, because I'm also in that, uh, in that sort of circle, um, but not as close as Brittany is. So I would love for her to tell the story about how you got to work with Russell Brunson. And maybe I'll let you explain who he is <laughs> for anyone yeah. that doesn't know. So Russell is one of the founders of ClickFunnels, which is a software um, that helps you build funnels. It's a front end um, software that helps you build funnels. It also has, um, you know, all the other things into it. So emails and SMS and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it's very popular in our space because it allows you to just get a funnel up in a couple seconds and push it out there. It also has a really big community attached to it and they do live events like Funnel Hacking Live. Um, so it's a it's a large um, training platform. It's kind of everything that marketers need. Um, I came into his world because I was following um, Julie Chanel. She had a, a affiliate like launch basically happening for Expert Secrets, which is one of Russell's books. He wrote um, dot com secrets, expert secrets, traffic secrets. So at the time, expert secrets was the newest book and she was doing a affiliate launch. And I was like, just trying to help her out. I didn't even really know he was in my awareness, but I didn't know of like much about him. 
And so I bought the book. I bought like two or three of the books because I was trying to get her, you know, and she did amazing in that launch. Um, so got into his world more, figured out like that he really knew what he was talking about and his, the way that he explained things really like clicked in my brain. Um, fast forward maybe three or four years and Julie was working um, as the VP of, of marketing at ClickFunnels and said they were looking for a copywriter. So I submitted with the C of other people who submitted <laughs> to do it. Um, and it was a test project. I obsessed over that email for seven hours and oh obsessed over if I should say awesome or amazing in it because <laughs> I, as a copywriter, you nerd about these things like because mm -hmm. I want to sound like the person. So I was going through all of his YouTube videos and being like, well, he says awesome in this one, but amazing in this one. And I was like trying to just, I needed to sound exactly like he wrote it. And so it was a long process. Wow. It was, there was that, there was another email and you got, you know, you got picked out of the bunch and then picked out of the bunch again and picked out of the bunch again. So there was like a lot of, um, you know, steps there and it was all test projects. So you just had to know your stuff. And that was that, which I loved at, at the time because it was like validating me as my experience was growing. Um, and then I got brought on. And I was writing um, just the emails for like the Marketing Secrets podcast. And there was something else that was going out at the time. It, they were recurring emails, like teaser style emails. Yeah, okay. Um, and he went over to Julie and was like, who's writing these emails on the team? And she told him it was me. And he was like, I guess wanted me to be his personal writer after that. Like he saw what was happening. And so I got brought on to just exclusively be his voice in emails. It was I think at the time, easier, like structure wise for him to have a copywriter. I was working with another amazing copywriter, Karen King. She's amazing. Um, she was, she was focusing on like sales funnels and like other like um, materials. And I yeah. was focusing on emails. So it just like was easy to divide and conquer yeah. that way. Um, and so that was like where I ended up niching and was there for a while. It was great. Um, after I left full time, I still was doing it, you know, here and there for them. So it's been a great working relationship and they were wonderful. And, um, yeah, it was really kind of a crazy ride, but, um, really excited and blessed that that happened. Yeah, that is awesome. That, how cool is that, that out of so many emails now, I'm just curious with so many emails, was it him actually going through all of the weeding through or did, did, did you just happen to get lucky and he saw yours or I, I'm, I'm curious how that process I worked, if you know. I don't know. I do think that there was someone on the team who was, I'm, I'm sure that Karen was reading them. I don't know. I have, yeah. this is like unverified, but I'm sure that Karen was reading them because she was the lead copywriter. So I'm yes. sure she had a hand. Um, John Parks, I'm sure had a hand. There was like other people on the team who I'm sure were available to yeah. do that. When he saw, what I know is that when he saw my emails, I was already on the team. So I don't know if he had seen them before or not, but when he came to Julie to say, who's writing these, he like those he just seen in his inbox, I'm assuming. Oh that's yeah. Okay. That's, but, that's so cool. Did you go to Funnel Hacking Live last year? It was I in did. Orlando. I did. I didn't go to the full conference because I was uh, right in the middle of a play, actually like a, a run of a play. And so oh. I just stopped by to see friends in the lobby <laughs> real quick. Oh, okay. Was, okay. Was popping in and out. Um, but yes, I, I was, I was there for just a second. <laughs> Yeah, I I was there. It was my first time going. It was so cool. I had so much fun. It's yeah. wild. <laughs> it's crazy. It's the 1% crazy. Anyway, no, I, I love that story about how, I love what you said about how it validated your, you and your writing because that's so, I, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong because I'm not a writer. I, I do some copy, but it, not to the, no, nowhere near what you're doing, right? But to have to be somebody's voice, like somebody one person's voice I can't imagine must be so much harder I would think to to have to sound exactly like that person rather than just to write copy for a message or service right can you talk about that a little bit and how your, what your process was like yes um this is where the weirdness of my two skill sets comes in because okay. as an actor I take on someone else's identity a lot and so I kind of have that weird, I had that weird skill set going into writing that I had gone into characters before and yes. figured out how they like 
thought and moved and all that. And I really was not doing a lot of deep work as an actor at that point because I had just done, you know, community theaters. Yeah, back. sure. Um, but so there's some aspect of that that made it make sense in my brain to be this person. Like it was almost like I was acting as this person. Um, and then I also, as I, as time went on, I figured out ways that it made more sense to my brain. So, um, Russell would send me a Voxer message. I'm an auditory learner. And I always tell copywriters, figure out how you learn, because if you're visual, go read a bunch of their stuff, go read blogs, go read things that they've written. I'm auditory. And it worked out like, like process wise for him. He would brain dump on Voxer and a lot of my clients brain dump on Voxer. And so I can actually just hear the way that he's speaking. And yeah. so like, that is helpful to me. And then I also, I break rules a lot as a copywriter. I don't like, if he says he uses um, like something that maybe I would write properly, like grammar wise, like I will, I will say it the way that he said it vocally in, in the email versus right. writing it like technically correct and making it, for, it makes it too formal, especially for someone like Russell. Um, I have other clients who are more academic. And so when they, I will change it for them because I know that even though that's how they speak, they don't want their emails to sound that way. So it's like, there's a lot of nuance. Um, I know that Russell wants it to sound or did want it to sound like he just was talking to his list, which he was, he right. was just me, you know, to find to formalize it and stuff. But so he was, that was his way. And so it, it was, it's very different depending that's on the client. Um, I tend to prefer writing for an individual. A company um, is is great, but I do find myself getting a little more bored. Like to just write for a company, yeah, it's, it's more uh, structured, and so I like I like actually stepping into people's voices. So, do you focus more um, with your clients now? Your high your uh, high ticket coaches, I think, is what you said is your your mm -hmm. uh, main um, client. So, do you focus mainly on their emails or do you do all of their messaging or how? To all of it. Yeah. So emails, emails were my background, but because of that, I had the seat, like I, everything was coming from or going to emails. And so I got really versed in like the entire funnel system yep. and the marketing plan, just because I, my, my piece was touching everything else. Like it just, it just worked out that way. And so now what I do with, with coaches is I help them develop um, I call it a high ticket harvest. It's basically um, some type of event that pulls people out of their list and makes them and turns them into high ticket uh, students or clients. Mm -hmm. And so I help them develop that event, whether it's a workshop or a, a three day boot camp, whatever it is. I help them develop the event. We do not only the messaging inside the event. So we talk about what they're going to say, when they're going to say it, what false beliefs they're going to break and when. Also, the messaging that positions that to their list. Um, then we talk about how to get them from the event to a sales call. Typically it runs to sales calls um, and all that. So it's, it's soup to nuts. Like it's the whole, I help them get people out of their existing audience in every capacity, <laughs> in every place that it touches. Um, but my background in, in really understanding copy is like fundamental in that because messaging is copy amplified. So, oh yeah. I, yeah. I tell everybody, you know, when we talk about funnels that the messaging is the most important thing. Uh, I mean, because if you're not talking, saying the right words to the right people, you're wasting money. One hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. No, I love that. I, I, I just, I think that is so cool. What you do, it's such a hands-on process, taking them from start to finish. I, I love that. Do you also help them determine what would be best for their specific, um, if their coaches, students, whether it be a challenge or a workshop. Do you help them determine that too? I do. Yeah. yeah. A lot of it. So the people I'm working with are experts. And so I, I bring my expert knowledge in that the positioning and the way that it's structured and when we should run it and all those things. But I also rely on them to have an expert level of knowledge of what is your client need? Basically we need the, the simplest path, but the one that includes what your client needs to make a decision. How much information do they need to make a decision? Is it a $20,000 program or is it a $5,000 program? Is it something that's promising health results? And so in that, they might need more false belief breaking because maybe they have diagnoses. Maybe they have other questions that are deeper. So it really mm. depends. Like I rely on them to know that, know how deep we need to go 
And then I bring my knowledge of like, okay, now we know what false beliefs need to be broken. You should do it in this order and we need to position it in this way. Stop teaching so much. That's why I tell my coaches all the time, stop teaching. <laughs> like, yeah. they, you know, they want to because they're coaches. So like, there's so much that I bring there, but I do rely on them to be experts in their target audience. Yep. I love that. Stop teaching. Uh, Brittany and I have a, a shared coach. Um, we'll talk about Josh for a second because he says that all the time. Stop teaching, stop teaching, right? So let's talk about that because somebody listening might be like, wait, what does she mean stop teaching? Aren't you supposed to, to teach your students how to do X? So let's talk about that for, for a minute because teaching is the fastest way to lose a potential client, right, Brittany? 100%. <laughs> one of, yeah, one of the fastest, yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. So talk about that a little bit, if you could, what you mean by that. For yeah. People listening. So there's a couple of different ways that it loses you. Um, <laughs> but, but one of the ways and what I, what I talk about with marketing is that when we teach, when we go into teacher mode, number one, overwhelm happens because people are now trying, they, they now are trying to take notes and think about how they're going to implement it into their day-to-day -day life. And they have questions popping up and you are going because you're in a, a workshop, boot camp, whatever it is that you're doing, you're going and they are questioning. They're yep. sitting there going, oh, wait, 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 wait. Did they just say, so should I do two or three? They're lost already. Confused minds don't buy. Also, we are giving them, when we teach too much, we give false confidence that they can get off and go do it themselves. They mm -hmm. think that there's some level of like, if you're teaching so much that they feel like, okay, I can take that system and go they might be able to do a piece of it on their own, but one, they're not going to have you when questions come up Two, they're not going to have accountability, whatever it is that your offer is. There's a reason why people need you to walk with them through the offer, especially in a high ticket setting. There's always some level of built-in support, community, accountability, whatever. So it gives a false sense of confidence to people who are listening when you teach too much that they can just go do it on their own. And statistically speaking, that's just not the case. They don't. Right. So it's doing a disservice. It feels like a service as a coach in the moment because you're like, all right, I'll share my knowledge, but they're not prepped for it. They don't have the foundation for it. They're not going through your entire program in that moment. So it's it really starts to, to cause a disconnect and confusion, overwhelm, all the things. So instead, for anyone listening that might be like, well, God, I don't know what, what would I talk about then if I'm not going to teach my stuff? So what what would somebody do instead that's maybe doing a, a you know a three day workshop or 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 a challenge rather than teach their stuff and give give away all the goods up front what would they do <laughs> so you want to talk josh talks about this all the time too you want to yeah. talk about the solution basically yep. in russell's terminology it's the vehicle it's everybody has a different way to to talk about it but you want to talk about the new opportunity you want to talk about the thing that's going to get them out of where they are and get them to where they want to be. So right. that's really what you want to focus on. And then the false beliefs that you're breaking is false beliefs around the vehicle. Russell talked about internal and external false beliefs. All these, all these things tie in together. So if, if your uh, program is, is helping people lose weight. And so you're saying like the new opportunity is like mental reprogramming and NLP and all the, it's like, understanding your brain because everybody logically knows okay i need to eat fewer calories than i am than i'm expending so right. like they know that that's the formula but people aren't doing it so there's some disconnect and so if your program this is a coach i'm working with right now he's amazing if your program is is focused on that that's the new vehicle that's the solution the solution is to master your mind mm -hmm. and so he so his everything that he would be talking about is about the solution itself and about what it is that they need to do and then breaking false beliefs around the solution. So then now people understand and they don't feel like they can just go change their brain. No, they, they need like yeah. they can hang up and go do that. So they need him and they do need him. He offers a great service. So yeah. it's all, I mean, ethical, everything is ethical, but that's what you're trying to do is get them to understand that, that what you have is the thing that they need on their own. Yep. Awesome. That was a, that was a great marketing lesson for anyone listening. <laughs> if, if you're, if you have a product or service that, that was, that was great. Um, but I want to pivot for a minute because you said something earlier that I wanted to dive into and we kind of got uh, off track a little bit, but you said earlier when we were talking about whether we were born or made entrepreneurs, that you probably had about 75 businesses. Yeah. 
So I want to hear like about little Brittany, maybe younger Brittany. And what, what were some of those businesses that you had when you were young? Oh God. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> I had the newspaper, right. Which is um, great, by the way. That's that's a great idea. I was handwriting this newspaper. My poor neighbor, <laughs> they did not sign up for this. It was not, you know, but wait, they got wait, wait, wait. You were handwriting each one? Yes. It, on construction paper with with like markers and everything and decorating it. Yeah, it was a whole thing. Oh my I god. Homeschooled. I was homeschooled. So it was I my mom might have even worked this into the curriculum. I don't know, but it was like a creative project for me. Like I was sitting there like doing that it. It's awesome. Not scalable. It's not a scalable model. Oh, definitely not. Um, I also sold stickers door to door in my neighborhood. I got a sheet of stickers at like uh, Party City, you know, those like rolls yes. and was tearing them so that there were sections and I was sold those door to door. I was saving up for a swing set. Um, How much so did I you was, sell a sticker for? I have to know. I want to say it was like $5 for a sheet. This is, this is a long time ago, but wow. yeah, it, I was selling sheets. Um, I also sold there, this was like, I think a Girl Scouts thing or something, but you could sell, you sold like wrapping paper. I don't know if that's like, it's still a thing, but you like rolls of wrapping paper. It was yeah. like, Instagram. yeah. Um, wrapping paper and, and candy and stuff. Candy did bars. Door to door stuff. I yeah. think that's popular now, but. Um, yeah, so I did all that. And then in my, in my early twenties, I had a lot of like startups. So I did, um, at, in college, I was wanting to maybe explore PR as something, cause I was writing some press releases in terms of like in my journalism training or like understanding what press releases were. And yeah. like, so I was like, I can write a press release. I'm good at messaging. I didn't know that's what it was at the time, but, um, so I was like going down the, the path of maybe having a, a, a PR firm. Wow. Um, okay. I was also a trainer, a personal trainer for a while. And that was how I was getting through college because I could schedule my clients around, you know, yeah, classes. Right. Yeah. So I was doing that and I was like, I, someone needs to develop a program that is like tender for, um, for trainers and clients. Like I need a trainer who is in this area and, and knows about like ACL repair and, and whatever, and is specializes in, um, you know, women, fitness, nutrition, whatever. So like you put in your, your things that you're yeah. looking for and you swipe and find a trainer. So I was developing an app that did that. And I, I think it, I don't know where it ended up, but it was called Zenefit. I don't know why, but <laughs> yeah, so I, I, there's been a lot. Um, and I did. That's a good, I would think you what? Did digital courses, like online courses. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, that is a great idea for that. I would have thought that would have been like a huge success. <laughs> That's... I knew, I knew next to nothing about anything. Yeah. Like I didn't know how to <laughs> trademark anything. I knew nothing. And so I was just developing this thing and I had found some guy, it wasn't fiber back then. I don't remember what it was, but I'd found someone to start to develop the code and yeah, it just, it, it fell by the wayside, but yeah, yeah. So there's a free idea. If someone is in that space. <laughs> yeah. All right. I know. Yeah. Anyone listening. Yeah. There you go. I, I mean, you could probably do that with any uh, professional industry, although they have like Zoc, what is it? ZocDoc or ZenDoc or something like oh, that. Yes. Now for, so it's, yeah, definitely somebody do that. <laughs> so what's next for you? Anything new and exciting coming up on the horizon? Um, well, so we have these books coming out. I just booked a project um, where it's a, it's a short film in the area. So I'm working on that. Awesome. Um, and then really just like continuing to, you know, build out these, these projects that we're working on. So we have several scripts that are in development. So we're like continuing to work on those more and more. And um, screenwriting is fun to me because it's very similar to writing a script in some ways, like for YouTube or for something like that. There's a lot of the same elements, um, but obviously very different fiction. Yeah. Yeah. Wise. So we're continuing to develop those um, and we have these books coming out. So it's like, we got a lot of irons in the fire, but we're very focused on the one thing like that we're working on right now. And so we kind of like zoom in and out. So we try not to be sure. like, you know, all over the place, but we do have a lot of things in the background, but my organizational brain um, has them all <laughs> scheduled out. We'll work on that next month. <laughs> right now. Are you planning to stay in Orlando or do you think we, that you might go ahead? We are in talks of going to New York. That's, mm -hmm. that's like 
you know, it's just where we need to be. Yeah. I was going to say, I mean, Orlando is great. There's a lot going on there, but for what you're doing, it seems like you would need to be in the yeah. city. Yeah. New York city is definitely in our plans. Um, we're working on exact timing and everything. Um, but that is, that's likely where we're going to end up. Good, good, good. And you'll be closer to me. So maybe we can yeah. visit. <laughs> All that. Yeah. Um, okay. Awesome. So we're coming to the end here. And by the way, I'll make sure I put all that information in the show notes. So if you, you know, have links to anything like that, I'll, we'll, we'll include everything that Brittany's doing in, in the show notes for anyone that's listening. Um, so at the end of every episode, I don't know if you've ever listened to one of my episodes, but I always ask a few random questions, just okay. silly questions to get to know you better. Okay. All right. So you ready? Mm -hmm. If you were given the opportunity to um, go to space and walk on the moon, would you? I'm too much of a chicken. I want to <laughs> say yes, because that's the right answer. But no, probably not. <laughs> there is nothing wrong with saying no. I I am a hard no on that. There is, I will stay right here. Thank you. Uh-uh. Nope. Um, so yeah, I understand. Okay. If, if given the opportunity to have dinner with anyone at all, alive or dead, who would you pick? Oh, this is the hardest question. <laughs> I've always been asked it. It's like a networking question, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I've always ask this. <sighs> well, then you should know your answer, right? <laughs> I should. Um, for some reason, what's coming to mind is Malcolm Gladwell because I love his books. I don't Okay. I don't know if that's the correct answer or not. I probably will think of one right when I get off here, but I'm gonna say that <laughs> just because. That's what's in my mind. <laughs> All right. Well, if you think of another one, you can tell me and I'll, I'll put it in the show notes. All right. <laughs> and then last, I love to hear about people's morning routines because it's mm -hmm. just, it just fascinates me how people start their day, especially successful people. So tell me, what is the first thing you do in the morning? If it's, if it's something you do every morning. I want to say it's something really groundbreaking, but I definitely make coffee first. Okay. Here, so, um, <laughs> but for a while, I will say that one of the most successful morning routines that I had was, I called it the 40 minute rule. And so for 20 minutes, I would meditate. And then for 20 minutes, I would clean up my space. And so I felt like I was starting from a clean space, like in my mind and in my environment, because I'm very environmental. Like I, I can't, if there's clutter, yeah, so yeah, 20 yeah. minutes meditating and then 20 minutes cleaning my immediate environment, just running stuff upstairs if it needed to go or whatever. And I felt like that I could stick to the most consistently. It wasn't too long. And it was just like, it really gave me like a fresh start in both areas of my yeah. life. So that was a good one. I love that. I love that. I, I have recently been thinking, just side note, I have recently been thinking about um, taking some meditation because I've never, I've never done that before, but I'm, the more people I interview that, that have, and like, you know, done the mind work, it just, it seems like it's so beneficial. It's so good. There's all, I mean, just open YouTube and do a guided one first. That is like the easiest one. Cause it, it, then you're not like thinking like, what am I supposed to be thinking or not thinking? That took me a while. Yeah. Well, yeah, because I have a busy brain. I don't know if, if you, you do too, but my brain is constantly like on. rapid fire, you know? So I always thought, oh, I, meditation's not possible for me, but- Guided meditations. Yeah, that'll yeah. help. Okay. Guided meditations. Awesome. Brittany, it has been awesome having you here today. I am so thrilled that we got to connect outside of our outside of our coaching program. And I am looking forward to, to seeing all of your new projects come to fruition. Thanks so much. This was wonderful. Yes. Thank you. And everyone, thank you for listening. And we will see you on the next episode of the Born or Made podcast.